There's an old photo which accompanies an obituary published online by the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in December 2020. Alongside a subheader that reads, In loving memory of Starkey L. Swinson and Lois I. Swinson, a young Starkey sits in shades of black and white with Lois on his lap as a nearby window drapes the entire scene with sunlight. Neither of the pair looks directly into the camera. Lois, with neatly curled hair and a dark floral-themed dress, gazes beaming out of the window, her face awash in the light. She appears energetic and hopeful, a dreamer staring into endless possibilities ahead. The image captures that rare, infectious quality few possess in which they seem to radiate a joy that leaps off the page. Lois, no doubt, has it in spades. Starkey wears a white-collared shirt, his hair hand-swept back in the popular style of the day for young professionals. He's turned toward Lois, his eyes and head tilted slightly down, and a bright but somewhat personal smile on his face, as if absorbing and reflecting on the moment. He looks youthful, athletic, and intelligent, a quintessential All-American from that era, an individual destined for success. The overall scene is quite striking. It seems to capture the story of the couple, portraying their happiness and love, while also hinting at the personalities and qualities of each individual. It was, undoubtedly, chosen for the publication by their family members for this very reason. Viewing the photo is, to be honest, refreshing. It offers a glimpse into a life too often only remembered in terms of death. In it, you see people, not victims. Parents, friends, and neighbors to those who carry with them the memories of an entire lifetime, rather than only the unanswered questions of its very end. It's the way in which, I believe, anyone would want to be remembered. But the old photo is additionally a reminder of why the search for Starkey Swenson is important. It underscores the happier times that, for some, are clouded in memory by the murky uncertainties of Starkey's disappearance. To find his remains would offer answers and closure and the chance to give Starkey Swenson the resting place he deserves. I'm Matt Hiskus, co-host of Cold Case Frozen Tundra. This is episode 11, Until No Doubt Remains. Hello and welcome to the Cold Case Frozen Tundra podcast. I'm your co-host, Dr. Jordan Karsten. Today's show will be the last episode in this season, but it's certainly not the end of our search for the missing remains of Starkey Swenson. Nor will this be the last update that we provide you on this case. It's an investigation that has now drawn significant interest and support from so many individuals. Throughout this series, we've shared the story of Starkey Swenson's disappearance the events that followed, and the recent updates that led to our excavation at a property in Omro, Wisconsin. Our investigation, and really this podcast, has been the result of hundreds of hours spent researching the known facts available in the public record, speaking with those most closely involved in the case to learn details not found in those accounts, walking the various scenes ourselves to get a sense of the case, and of course, participating hands-on in the excavation to hopefully recover Starkey Swenson's remains. We want to start this episode by sharing what we believe are the key facts of this case, what we've learned throughout this investigation. We aren't going to go through each detail of the story, as that has been covered in earlier episodes, but we do want to share some of the core elements that impact the understanding of the case, our best theory of what occurred, and the evidence that supports this. Before we jump in, I want to clarify that these statements are our own personal beliefs of what occurred before, during, and following Starkey Swenson's disappearance. They are based on the research we've compiled over this entire process, our own observations from visiting all of the key locations, and from many, many conversations we've had with individuals closely related to this case. You've heard of, or heard from, several of these individuals throughout this podcast. But there are many others who have elected to speak with us on background, people who did not wish to be recorded or have their names revealed. 
We are continually thankful for the information they've provided, and we completely understand and respect their wishes. We will attribute information we've received wherever possible, and we'll also mention where we have obtained details that are linked to unnamed sources. Okay, let's jump in. Okay, first of all, we believe that John C. Andrews murdered Starkey Swenson. We believe they arrested, tried, and imprisoned the right guy. Based on all the evidence, that probably isn't too much of a revelation. And to be honest, we've been confident in that belief since the early stages of our research on the case, but it is worthwhile place to start. Maybe a less obvious point, but something we also believe to be true, is that John Andrews premeditated Starkey Swinson's murder. He planned it. He may not have selected the exact date, time, and place, but we've heard from a number of sources that by the night of August 13, 1983, John had made up his mind that he would kill Starkey. We first heard this from Suzanne Eggert in the preliminary hearing and trial, when she reported John drove her past the Swenson's home on at least two occasions, stating that that's where Starkey Swenson lives, and I'd like to kill him. We've heard similar details from Starkey Swenson's own family members, who told us that in the days and months leading up to his disappearance, Starkey had expressed he was afraid of John. He had told his wife and daughters that John had threatened him in the past and that if anything happened to him, John Andrews was likely the man who did it. These personal statements and reports of threats are enough evidence, at least in our minds, that John Andrews had no doubt in his mind who Starkey Swenson was, that he was involved in a relationship with John's ex-wife, Claire, and that he had reached the point that he wanted Starkey dead. There have been theories rooted in these reports that John Andrews may have planned Starkey's murder to the point that he already selected a burial site on the Amro property, or even dug a grave there in advance. Well, there's certainly a chance John could have done this given his access to the property during that time frame. We don't have any evidence to either support or disprove that theory. Perhaps our only chance of knowing this is to find and uncover the missing remains. And even that may not give us the answers we seek as to whether John pre-selected his method of disposing of Starkey's body. As a result of our work on this case, we believe that the murder did occur at the Shattuck Junior High School on the night of August 13, 1983, and that it was the result of John Andrews hitting Starkey Swenson with his 1973 Trans Am following an argument. The main points of Suzanne Eggert's testimony, in our opinion, are credible. Although some elements of her story included to support her claim, might be a little more dubious. It makes sense that Suzanne could have been outside the Shattuck Junior High that night and overheard the events in the alcove. John, then her boyfriend, had told her that he'd be stopping by Claire's house, which is right across the street from the school, and that he'd be coming to visit Suzanne. In our minds, it's not a coincidence that Suzanne is outside the school and Claire's house that night. It's not that she happened to swing by on a drive around town, as she told the court. It's much more likely, and honestly, much more believable and relatable, that she was checking up on her boyfriend who'd been gone all day at his ex's house. We walked that site and can say, without a shadow of a doubt, Suzanne would have heard a loud argument, a revving muscle car, and the other noises she described from her location at the corner of Elm Street and Division. The alcove where the events occurred is only a short distance from that intersection, though with a building in between. That said, imagine those events occurring in the backyard of a house while you stood in the front driveway. You'd likely hear them. It's also very plausible that Suzanne would recognize the voice of John Andrews. He's her boyfriend, after all. And even more than that, he has a British accent in a Midwestern Wisconsin town there is little doubt she would have known it was him. Right, and what is a little more difficult to comprehend is her statement that she then drove down Elm Street, a neighborhood block, turned the corner onto Loudon Boulevard, parked there, and then saw John Andrews leaning over the trunk of his car. When we walked the site, we were astounded at the distance from Loudon Boulevard into the alcove. In broad daylight, we were hardly able to make out the form of a person walking into the alcove from Suzanne's reported location and she was there in the dead of night. Moreover, we received photos from Christie, a teacher at Shattuck Junior High, which revealed that in 1983, a fenced-in tennis court complex was located between Loudon Boulevard and the alcove. 
further casting doubt on the ability to see into the courtyard from Suzanne's vantage point. Most likely, this is a case of Suzanne having the correct details of the events that she overheard on the night of the murder. But, as has been well-researched and documented, witness stories tend to evolve, consciously or unconsciously. Over time, as pressure is applied in statements, interviews, and even in court, where witnesses are essentially asked to prove that they are accurately reporting the facts. Suzanne was telling her story in court over a decade after the events occurred. It's certainly plausible that small details have been misremembered, altered, and embedded in her own mind over that time. One question that remains unanswered for us, and it's something we may never know, is regarding Claire Andrews. When we walked Elm Street near her house and the Shattuck Junior High, we were struck by how close her home sits to the actual crime scene. In fact, Suzanne Eggert's reported location that night at the corner of Elman Division is no closer to the alcove than Claire's own house, which is directly across the street. Of course, Claire may have been inside with her windows and doors all shut, and this is likely even the case. But even so, it makes you wonder if she would have heard the events from her home. If you live in a neighborhood setting yourself, picture someone at the home across the street maybe even in the backyard of that home, revving a muscle car's engine so wildly that it builds up enough power to run someone down. Would you hear it? We do know, based on the facts of the case and Claire's own testimony in court, that she continues to see John Andrews and maintain a sexual relationship with him after the night of August 13th. She testified that he had made statements to her during that time in which he speculated what may have become of Starkey Swenson. We know they stuck with her as she's able to remember them over a decade later. In court, Claire made a statement that we do find difficult to believe. She told the jury that she did not think John Andrews knew who Starkey Swenson was and that she doubted he could pick Starkey out of a photo lineup of 10 individuals. Yet, we know that John had told Suzanne where Starkey Swenson lived, much more detailed information than who he was, And we've also learned that he had threatened Starkey directly to the point he was telling his friends and family about his fear of John. Moreover, we know that John had seen Claire with Starkey on at least two occasions. Once after he found them in a hotel room together after their divorce, and a second time when Claire reported John verbally accosted her after watching Starkey drop her at her car following a rendezvous in Oshkosh. This makes it incredibly hard to believe that Claire is telling the truth when she says John did not know who Starkey Swenson was. It raises questions about Claire's own knowledge of the case. Had she been keeping a secret? Or maybe was she intimidated by John, just as Suzanne Eggert reported for over a decade? We may not ever learn the answer to this. Yeah, that's right. It's definitely an interesting point, but it's not anything that we were able to obtain evidence to support at this stage. One more detail we do find credible in this case is John's presence in Omro on the night of the murder. He places himself there. We've also learned that others have since reported seeing John in Omro on that date, although it's worth mentioning that the exact dates of events, especially when reported decades later, should be considered only marginally reliable at best. But we will take John at his word here, and we consider the other witnesses as possible supporting evidence. Omro is a small town. It would be a very strange place to use as an alibi if you weren't there. It's the type of place where everyone would know everyone else and, at the time, would have been easy to prove if John had not been there. It's also so far in the other direction from John's home and other likely places to visit that it seems like it would be too outlandish a place to select if lying about his whereabouts. Some witnesses who state that they saw John in Amro that night have reported seeing him doing his nighttime gardening on the property now owned by Jean and her family. Others have said they saw him at the drop zone bar and that he was covered in dirt. While these reports are, without a doubt, intriguing and are certainly plausible, we find it hard to put too much certainty into these accounts. There's just too much time that's passed since the night of the murder. Witnesses too unreliable with specifics such as dates and times to use reports to confidently claim that John was on Jean's land on August 13, and that he then went to the drop zone bar covered in dirt. Is it plausible? Yes. Certain? We aren't prepared to say just that.
Here at the Cold Case Frozen Thunder podcast, the only thing Matt and I love more than trying to solve a cold case is cracking open our own cold case of beer. Today's episode of Cold Case Frozen Tundra is sponsored by Perrin Brewing Company. Based in West Michigan, one of the country's leading destinations for those who seek fine craft beer, Perrin Brewing, that's P-E-R-R-I-N, stands out due to their consistent use of the highest quality ingredients, their creative exploration of new tastes, and their outstanding year-round staples. Perrin's Black Ale has been a favorite of mine for several years, while it pours dark and has the hints of chocolate and coffee found in many stouts, the Black Ale drinks lighter than other beers and is great for any occasion. I've recently had a chance to try Perrin's 5910 IPA and is a fan of all India Pale Ales. I have to say that the 5910 is one of my all-time favorites. If you're into something even more bold, I also highly recommend Perrin's new Double Pay, Double IPA. Click the link in this episode's show notes head to the Brands We Love section of our podcast website, or check out perrinbrewing.com for more information on Perrin beers, including a helpful beer finder tool. Try Perrin Brewing and experience liquid craftsmanship. And that brings us to our last belief. It's about what is probably the biggest question in this case at this stage, the property in Amro. Is Starkey Swenson buried there? Was he ever buried there? I led this off by saying it's a belief, but really, it's more of an unanswered question. We just don't know, and that's why the search continues. That's right. We named this episode Until No Doubt Remains, and that's exactly our plan for the site and this case. As we discussed last week, our three-week scheduled excavation at the site led to a few possibly interesting pieces of evidence, such as a broken piece of headlight and other pieces of metal, but still no human remains. With that said, we've only excavated about 10% of the site. We're planning to continue the search by excavating the entire area until we either find Starkey Svensson's remains or can confidently say that they've never been on the property. In a local media report just this past week, Detectives working on the case were reported as stating that they believe the most interesting areas of the site have yet to be searched. Yeah, and I think that that's probably true. As they pointed out, a lot of the tree cover that we see today was not present in 1983. Moreover, when you consider how an individual would likely behave when seeking to hide a body in a clandestine burial, it makes sense that person would push a little deeper into the tree line before digging a hole. Since we are using science-based archaeological principles in our search, we must move through the site in an organized fashion. We don't just dig a pit at random points. Instead, we have to have a systematic way of approaching any type of site. It might mean that the search takes longer, but it allows us to be sure in our results. For this reason, we will methodically dig deeper into the site and start to enter some of the more interesting areas to search as we move along. We also have the water table to consider. As we discussed last week, we learned from research that Dan Joyce shared with us that the water table is likely at least a foot higher today than it was in 1983. This means that we're going to need to use a pump system to remove any standing water in key areas in order to allow us to push a little deeper into the ground. Yeah, that's very interesting. And it could certainly make a difference, especially with regard to some of the more intriguing anomalies we've already found and dug down to the current water level. So... Speaking in terms of things we believe about this case, we're not entirely sure what to say about the property in Amro. We believe that there are a number of plausible theories which would lead to Starkey Swenson being buried at that site. These theories strike us as more true to the facts of the case and are, overall, more believable than any other we've encountered, including the commonly held notion that Starkey Swenson was buried under a new runway at the Appleton Airport. We have also both felt what so many involved in this search have reported. There's just something about that site that seems to fit. Being there, speaking with others who are around at the time of the events, or are now involved in the search, certainly does have an impact on this, but there is some sort of sense that we're searching in the right spot. I think the best way to describe our thoughts about the current excavation site is to put it in terms of setting odds for a sporting event. A race, let's say. 
there's a broad field of participants in the race. Some are, of course, much more likely to win, the favorites, which are given the highest odds of claiming the victory. But even in a race where there is one extremely heavy favorite, that racer might be given even money to win, or maybe even less than that. Meaning that, at most, the racer will be victorious 50% of the time, while the other 50% of the time, the winner comes from the rest of the remaining field. Now, that's an overly simple odds-making example, but I think it explains the Amro property well. The site in Amro is, hands down, the most likely site for Starkey's remains we've encountered throughout our work on this case. Even after excavating about 10% of the site, we are still excited about the possibility of that property holding the answers we, Starkey's family and friends, and so many others seek. It's, in odds-making terms, the heavy favorite. But, against the entire field, the sum of all other possible locations for Starkey Swenson's remains, do we still believe the Amro property is more likely than all the other possibilities? It's hard to say. I think that that analogy is a really good one. The Amro property is far and away the best location we have to search based on all the evidence, the facts of the case, and the timeline of events. But if we're serious about our effort to find Starkey Swenson's remains and answers in this case, and we are, we can't just focus solely on the most likely possibility, which is the property in Amro. And so while that excavation will definitely continue until we've searched the entire area thoroughly, we're also working with law enforcement to take additional steps in hopes of locating Starkey Swenson's remains over the coming months or however long it takes. In the very near future, We'll be working with the detectives involved in this case to submit a request to certain jurisdictions in Wisconsin for information regarding any unidentified human skeletal remain that has been found since 1983. I've offered to take a look at any and all potential matches, comparing anthropological data with details known about Starkey to determine if any are a fit. It's important to note that in the years since 1983, we haven't just made significant advancements in identification technologies, such as DNA and fingerprint databases, but interagency communication tools have also improved by leaps and bounds. In 1983, police records were kept on paper, as were medical information, x-rays, and more. Communication between precincts may have been conducted in real time via radio, but at best, this would link a couple of local law enforcement teams together, far from an overarching database of shared information. Longer investigations and inquiries between jurisdictions required phone calls directly to the areas of interest. Officers would often need to know what they were looking for in advance. There was no system in place to search all sources for information. Right. This has obviously changed over the years and opened up some significant new possibilities and avenues that we intend to explore. Investigators are now able to make requests for information and receive responses from all possible matches versus calling each individual law enforcement jurisdiction to inquire. Important medical records, x-rays, measurements of remains, and more can now be electronically communicated, speeding up the process. Starkey Swenson's case in particular, because he went missing back in the 1980s and was declared legally dead uh, shortly thereafter, was never entered into a missing persons database. And so it remains very possible that his remains have been found in Wisconsin and have never been identified anthropologically. That's another angle that we can take in our investigation. And we aren't just stopping with Wisconsin, correct? That's right. I mean, the possibility always remains that John Andrews took Starkey Swenson out of the state of Wisconsin. The Upper Peninsula of Michigan is not far away and remains a viable place where Starkey's remains could have been buried. Minnesota is also nearby, so that's another place. Actually, with today's databases, we can attempt to find matches across state lines. And in fact, we can even contact law enforcement agencies in Canada. So during our investigation of the case, I had opportunity to speak with Steve Egger, the brother of Suzanne Egger, who was John's girlfriend at the time of the murder. Steve was friendly with John back in the 1980s, and in fact, was the reason John and Suzanne were introduced. 
Shortly after Starkey Swenson's disappearance, Steve told me that he visited John Andrews for a friendly afternoon get together. At that time, no one considered John to be at all related to Starkey's murder. Steve told me he made nothing of the visit or John's comments until much, much later, when John was publicly revealed as a person of interest in the case. Steve shared with me that he spoke with John that day over some cookies that he had sent to him from Britain, and John invited Steve over to enjoy those treats. As part of their casual conversation, John informed Steve that he had just been to Canada, a few hours drive north of his home in Appleton. John said that he was struck with how remote the area of Canada was and told Steve a person could visit there for several days without anyone finding you there. Later, as more scrutiny was placed on John's possible involvement in Starkey Swenson's disappearance, Steve realized that John's reported visit to Canada lined up with the time period just after Starkey Swenson went missing. Steve told me that he thinks John could have buried Starkey up north, potentially in a remote part of the Canadian backcountry. It's worth mentioning that it is incredibly risky to attempt to transport human remains across the border. While not impossible, it seems hard to believe that someone as intelligent as John Andrews, someone who is organized enough to have kept the body hidden for nearly 40 years, would take such an unnecessary risk in bringing Starkey Swenson's remains to Canada. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. It's certainly not outside the realm of possibility, but if we're considering the likelihood of the possible lead, it seems to me much more likely that John wanted to establish yet another layer of misdirection in this case. By telling a friend and a colleague that he'd just been to Canada, he could potentially lead any investigators who began to look this way in the case on a false lead. That doesn't mean that we can't look into it. Just as we're seeking information on remains found in Wisconsin, we can make a similar request to Canadian authorities. There's always a chance that John did cross the border, either legally or illegally, to bury Starkey Swenson. Although it's not probable, because of how risky it is to cross an international border with human remains in your car, that also doesn't mean it's not possible. And it's a possibility that we really shouldn't ignore. So... There's clearly a ton of work yet to do in the Starkey Swenson case. We have every intention and are committed to keeping the listeners of this podcast in the loop on changes as they develop. That said, much of this work takes time to organize and move forward. We are unlikely to have new information to share each week as this case progresses. Yeah, that's right. We'll be releasing bonus episodes in this season with new information in the case as it develops. If you're not already subscribed to this podcast, please click the subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform to ensure that you're notified when new episodes are released. You can also visit our website, frozentunderpodcast.com, to sign up for email updates from our show. We will not spam you with unwanted emails or any kind of partner offers but instead send an email to notify you when there's a new episode that's going to be released. In addition to releasing updates on the Starkey Swenson investigation, we are currently in the process of planning for our second season of Cold Case Frozen Tundra, in which we will dive into another Wisconsin case in search of answers that have evaded investigators for years. Subscribing to our podcast and signing up for the newsletter are two great ways to ensure you will not miss any new content from Cold Case Frozen Tundra. We thank you for joining us for this season in our search for Starkey Swenson's missing remains. We hope to return with answers in this case as soon as possible. <laughs>